Hello everyone. I'm Anisha. A member of the egalitarians. A very warm good on good evening to all who has joined now to participate in this virtual lecture. I take this opportunity to welcome everybody on behalf of egalitarians to the second edition of Dr. Ambedkar Memorial Lecture 2022. Before we introduce our beloved guest speaker of the day, Dr. Alpasha, and get into the schedule of the day, I'd like to take this opportunity to impress upon the origin of egalitarians, who we are and what we are up to. Egalitarians is a voluntary group committed to the principle of equality and working for a common goal of create, creating a casteless egalitarian society. We work in areas concerning annihilation of caste, social justice, affirmative action, quality education, and healthcare for the rural poor, and promoting constitutional morality. Primarily, our collective, the egalitarians, was formed as a proactive reactionary group of few friends due to an incident that surfaced in an educational institute of South India, where a student lost her life as a result of caste-based discrimination. With deep anguish and helplessness, we resorted to the use of RTI as a tool to unearth such caste-based discriminations in other educational institutes all over the country in an attempt to democratize academia. Currently, with a strength of around 80 plus members, we have been collecting data on caste diversity in educational institutes of the country and have been analyzing how far the mandated constitutional reservation mechanism is followed over there. We do not maintain, sorry, we do maintain an open access repository on the same and publish monthly newspaper to bring out the undernoticed discriminatory tales happening around the country to the forefront. All these updates are regularly maintained on our website. This has also been used by various media houses to augment their reports. We have also successfully persuaded people's representatives to raise the issue of institutionalized neglect of caste diversity in IITs and IIMs in Indian parliament through our open letters that we send to the member of parliament, members of parliament. Further, we do organize lecture series, publish articles, short stories, and poems that are written by our members with a motto of creating a constructive dialogue mechanism among people around the social stratification present in our society, its manifestations and its annihilation methods. And so we are here today for our Dr. Ambedkar Memorial Lecture 2022 with a resonating, resonating lecture titled Egalitarian Values, what we can learn from India's Adivasis for an anti-caste movement to be delivered by Dr. Alpasha, Professor of Anthropology from London School of Economics. Now that the introduction about egalitarians is done, I hand over the platform to the team who is about to perform a cultural event. Thank you, Anunol, for joining. Hey, hello everyone. I'm Sanjeev. I'm a member of Secretarian. So I'm very happy to be a part of this remarkable occasion. Before starting the performance, I would like to give a brief introduction about the Ghana music form. Ghana is a genre of Tamil music which arose in the slums and burial grounds of Chennai and evolved over the past two centuries. Ghana is sung in the Madras Bhasha dialect of Chennai. It is a rap-like collection of rhythms, beats, and sensibilities native to the Chennai people. There are different types of Ghana, namely Atigana, Algana, Jigidigana, and Maranagana. Maranagana is very unique to Tamil Ghana music. Maranagana means death. And Ghana means song in Tamil, a death song sung in the funerals of the people living in the slums of Chennai. And to be specific, it is a Dalit music form and the majority of the singers belonging to the Pariya community and ethnic group in Tamil Nadu. Its popularity rose when it was brought to the music of mainstream film industry, especially Tamil. Contemporary Ghana 
bands are bringing the genre to new audiences while using it for social activism, especially against caste discrimination. Now, I'm going to sing a Tamil Ghana song about the contributions of Dr. Baba Sahib Hamidkar to the society, which makes us egalitarian. And this Ghana song is a classic work of veteran Ghana singer, composer, and lyricist Ghana Ulagam Parani of Puliyandopu Chennai. தாழ்த்தப்பட்ட யாவரும் முன்னேற வேண்டும் என்று நம் நாட்டிற்காக உழைத்து பாடுபட்ட அம்பேத்கரை பாரும் என்று நம் நாட்டிற்காக உழைத்து பாடுபட்ட டாக்டர் பாபா சாஹிப் அம்பேத்கரை பாரும் என்று ஏ அண்ணா ஏ அவண்ணா ஏ அண்ணா ஏ அவண்ணா அண்ணா ஆவண்ணா அம்பேத்கரை பாருனா இவருக்கு இணை யாரனா அண்ணா ஆவண்ணா அம்பேத்கரை பாரனா இன்னா ஈயனா இவருக்கு இணை யாரனா ஈனா ஈயனா இவருக்கு இணை யாரனா 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 ஈனா ஈயனா இவருக்கு இணை யாரனா இக்கன உக்கனா எல்லோருக்கும் பக்தனா இக்கன உக்கனா எல்லோருக்கும் பக்தனா ஏ அண்ணா ஏ ஆவண்ணா ஏ அண்ணா ஏ அவண்ணா அண்ணா ஆவண்ணா அம்பேத்கரை பாரனா இன்னா ஈயனா இவருக்கு இணை யாரனா ஊனா ஊனா ஊருக்கெல்லாம் பக்தனா 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 ஊனா ஊனா ஊக்கமாக படிச்சனா உலக சாதனைய ஒப்பந்தமாய் கண்டனா உலக சாதனைய ஒப்பந்தமாய் தந்தனா ஏ அண்ணா ஏ அவண்ணா ஏ அண்ணா ஏ அவண்ணா அண்ணா ஆவண்ணா அம்பேத்கரை பாரனா இன்னா ஈயனா இவருக்கு இணை யாரனா ஏனா ஏயனா ஏழைக்கெல்லாம் அண்ணனா 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 ஏனா ஏயனா ஏழைக்கெல்லாம் அண்ணனா ஏழை மக்களுக்கு நல்லறிவை தந்தனா ஏழை மக்களுக்கு நல்லறிவை தந்தனா ஏ அண்ணா ஏ ஆவண்ணா ஏ அண்ணா ஏ ஆவண்ணா அண்ணா ஆவண்ணா அம்பேத்கரை பாரனா இன்னா ஈயனா இவருக்கு இணை யாரனா ஐயும் ஐயனா ஐநா சப ஆளுனா 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 ஐயும் ஐயனா ஐநா சப ஆளுனா ஐயம் தீர்த்தவரு அம்பேத்கரை பாரனா ஐயம் தீர்த்தவரு அம்பேத்கரை பாரனா ஏ அண்ணா ஏ ஆவண்ணா ஏ அண்ணா ஏ ஆவண்ணா அண்ணா ஆவண்ணா அம்பேத்கரை பாரனா இன்னா ஈயனா இவருக்கு இனி யாரனா ஓனா ஓவனா ஓவனாக படிச்சனா 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 ஓனா ஓவனா ஓவனாக படிச்சனா அவ்வும் அவனா அனைவருக்கும் தலைவனா இந்திய சட்டத்தை ஏ வகுத்து அண்ணலாம் ஏ அண்ணா ஏ ஆவண்ணா ஏ அண்ணா ஏ ஆவண்ணா அண்ணா ஆவண்ணா அம்பேத்கரை பாரனா இன்னா ஈயனா இவருக்கு இணை யாரனா அண்ணா ஆவண்ணா அம்பேத்கரை பாரனா இன்னா ஈயனா இவருக்கு இணை யாரனா தேங்க்யூ தேங்க்யூ சஞ்சு ஃபார் திஸ் அமேசிங் பெர்ஃபார்மன்ஸ் ஆஃப் தி கானா சாங் ஆன் அம்பேத்கர் அண்ட் ஹியர் லெட்ஸ் மூவ் ஆன் டு தி ஸ்பீக்கர் இன்ட்ரோடக்ஷன் பார்ட் ஆஃப் டுடே செஷன் Yeah, as we have told before, this lecture on egalitarian values, what can we learn from India's Adivosis for an anti-caste movement, is planned in December to commemorate the death anniversary of Dr. Ambedkar, who worked tirelessly to incor- incorporate untouchables into the mainstream society and uplift their status. We have Dr. Alpa Shah with us, the Honorable Guest Speaker, who is to deliver this lecture. She is Professor in Anthropology at the London School of Economics. Welcome, Dr. Shah. Thank you so much. Yeah, egalitarianism, the doctrine that emphasizes that all people are equal and so deserve equal rights and opportunities is largely practiced among tribes. Considering Indian tribes who are often called the Adivasis, they do not have a caste hierarchy. Unlike the Indian ma- majority of the Indian mainland, there have been claims that India cannot become a modern economic powerhouse 
without shedding caste and in this regard there is a lot to learn from the tribal culture dr shah has conducted a long term anthropological field work in eastern india where she lived amongst its indigenous people for more than 4 years this ethnographic research and her personal experience of living as a participant observer among the tribal com- tribal communities in a complex social lang- landscape makes her a competent individual to deliver today's lecture dr shah was raised in nairobi read geography at cambridge and completed her phd in anthropology at the london school of economics where she is now teaching as a professor she also leads the london school of economics international inequalities institute global economics of economies of care research team she is also the author of night march among india's revolutionary guerrillas winner of the 2022 sorry 2020 association for political and legal anthropology book prize shortlisted for the 2019 orwell prize for political writing and the new india foundation book prize and long listed for the tata literature light non fiction book award she is also the author of in the shadows of the state and co-author of ground down by growth she has reported for bbc radio 4 and the world service on several occasions including presenting and recording the radio documentary india's red belt for crossing continents she has also co-curated a major photo exhibition behind the indian boom she has won the 2022 european research council public engagement with research award her research has been generously supported by awards from the eu european research council the uk economic and social research council the british academy and the werner gren foundation we'll be very glad to listen to your insights on the topic egalitarian values what can we learn from india's adivasis for an anti caste movement dr shah i hand over the platform to you thank you thank you so much um thank you so much for this generous introduction thank you for the beautiful moving song um sanjeev kumar uh and thank you um for this invitation it's really an honor um to deliver this lecture um for the egalitarians um it means a lot to to do something in the memory of dr baba saheb ambedkar uh it also means a lot to me to learn about the egalitarians i'm very inspired by how you've come together uh the reasons why you came together and what you're trying to do um so yeah there's nothing but um yeah feeling <laughs> feeling feeling very moved to be to be here before you today um when i first uh, received your invitation in, in march uh, i thought i would share some reflections uh on the findings of the nationwide research that um i had led with professor jens lerke at soas uh with a team of uh, postdoctoral researchers uh, which includes jessel and raj who i think is in in the audience here on how caste discrimination persists in contemporary india uh despite economic growth how and why adivasis and dalits remain at the bottom of indian social and economic hierarchies despite despite growth and i thought that i would share some of the arguments of our book uh, our co-authored book ground down by growth um which has you know lots of very interesting cases including one from kudalore uh district in the in, in the chemical industrial belt in tamil nadu and looking at how dalits were transitioned from agriculture into the very lower lung, rungs of the chemical industrial belt doing the most toxic work in in the chemical factories um uh um anyway i i a few weeks ago we had a meeting together uh, with the galatians i'm so, so grateful you met with me ahead of the lecture and right at the end you know um uh they it became apparent to me that actually 
what you really wanted me to talk about was the situation of Adivasis. And I was really impressed with this. Uh, I really salute you for thinking so progressively beyond identitarian politics, which I believe was a real concern for Dr. Baba Saheb uh, Ambedkar too. Um, and which, you know, um, the, the kind of identitarian politics, which I believe as Professor Anand Taltumde has also pointed out, are too easy to fall into in trying to keep alive Dr. Baba Saheb's um, Ambedkar's legacy. So I salute you, uh, the egalitarians, especially for thinking about caste and tribe alliances, thinking about um, Adivasis alongside Dalits. And of course, uh, I oblige uh, to your request. So the title of my lecture is therefore, you know, egalitarian values, what can we learn from India's Adivasis for an anti-caste movement? How to achieve egalitarian values in a hierarchical society? This was a guiding concern for Baba Saheb Ambedkar, one which led him over the course of his life to try out many different paths from leading the anti-caste agitations at Mahad in the 1920s, to forming the Ind Independent Labour Party in the 1930s, to drafting the Indian constitution in the 1940s, to his turn to Buddhism in the 1950s. It was almost as if with each decade, he took another path, a different path, you know, learning from his mistakes, learning from his reflections, learning, learning, yeah, learning, thinking through, always he was thinking through. We owe so much to Dr. Baba Saheb Ambedkar and I admire him for so many reasons, including the fact that he was critically questioning the paths he took, searching for new ways when he realized that earlier ones had unintended consequences. He, he was so committed to the annihilation of caste, not through a predetermined program, not through a sacred text-like script, but through praxis, which is a dialectical relationship between things on the ground. I believe did not have enough time or opportunity to really think through the Adivasi question and what we may learn from India's Adivasis for an anti-caste movement. However, I believe that if he had had the good fortune of living with the forest dwelling communities in the hills uh, of central and eastern India, a good fortune that I have had, um, he may have had a whole new vision for what an anti-caste movement could also entail, a vision that emerges from the Adivasis of central and eastern India. So what I want to do today is um, think about a few things. And maybe if you don't mind, can I share? Uh, I have done a little PowerPoint with pictures. Could I, could I share it with you? If you allow me to share my screen, let's see. Um, sure, Alba, you can. Okay, I'm trying now. Mm -hmm. share. Let's see if this works. Oh, oh, what is that? That is not sharing, hang on. Um, let me see if this works. Here we go. Have I lost you? Are you still there? Yep, I yep. Need... Oh, there. Okay, hang on. There we go. Um, let me see if I can share my screen now. This works. Is that working? Yeah, we could see your screen. Yeah, perfect. You can see it? Okay, here we go. Um, uh, you can see it okay now? Yeah? Yeah, yeah, all good. Okay, I'm just going to move. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to do the following. First, I'm going to explore egalitarian values in Adivasi society. And I'm going to do, do it by looking at three different things. Political organization, production and consumption ethics, and gender relations. Then I'm going to look at how and why Adivas, um, egalitarian values are able to persist uh, in Adivasi society. Uh, and then I'm going to show how and why egalitarian values have been changed, have been undermined. And I'm going to do this by saying, showing two things, uh, the influence of two things. One is the influence of the state and education and reservations, uh, especially. And the second is capitalist forces, which are depleting land and resources, but also communities from within. 
And then I'm going to um, look at how these changes impact Adivasi egalitarian values. And I'm going to look at how with upward mobility also comes the reproduction of some hierarchical values, Brahminical ones, very similar to the processes that Professor Anantel Tumde has pointed out amongst Dalits, uh, and also a pauperization. And then finally, I'm going to think about what all of this means for an anti-caste movement. So um, yeah, I, I, there's a lot to get through. So let me just give you a little bit of context to why, um, why I am presenting to you what I'm presenting. Um, as you kindly very, uh, you know, uh, very nicely introduced, um, I, I, I'm an anthropologist and I, I train in the Malinovskian tradition of anthropological fieldwork at the LSC. Um, and this involved living with Adivasi communities in the hills and forests of Jharkhand in Eastern India uh, for four years, four and a half years actually. So um, let me just see if I can change my slide. There we go. Uh, everybody knows, I hope, here in this room where Jharkhand is. And first I was living, living amongst the Mundas, um, and then I was living amongst the Uraus. Uh, and I wasn't living in a city or a town, uh, not hopping and popping out in and out of people's lives with surveys and questionnaires, but I was living in the mud huts uh, amongst uh, the communities, I found myself amidst, um, yeah, doing what everybody else did, collecting wood for fuel from the forests, foraging for mushrooms, rugra and other delicacies, alongside sowing rice, chasing wild elephants when lots of wild elephants trying to break down the houses uh, in which people lived, and also following people to places where they migrated to, to brick factories on the banks of the Hooghly River where people went for six months of the year to make ends meet. Uh, I also traced family members from um, the, the courtyards where I lived back into the tea plantations of Assam where they had migrated several generations before. And so my insights into what I'm telling you today comes from these kind of this kind of deep immersion um, and, and also from seeing changes over generations as my association with some of the families I live with is now almost 25 years. Grandfathers have passed away, grandchildren have been born. Um, my insights also come from the fact that my last uh, long-term deep um, immersion fieldwork was in the forests in Jharkhand in a place that was a guerrilla stronghold of the Naxalites. So I not only saw how the state, but also how this movement for revolutionary change for an egalitarian society, no matter how wrong it could go, also impacted the Adivasis. And um, as you kindly pointed out, the results of this work uh, have been two books, uh, In the Shadows of the State and Night March, and one co-authored book, um, Ground Down by Growth, uh, and also a lot of academic articles. And I'm going to draw on all of this work uh, today uh, for, this, for this lecture, draw out some of the insights of all of this work. Now, um, of course, there are many similarities um, and differences also between Adivasis and Dalits, or rather those who happen to be categorized as scheduled castes by the Indian government and scheduled tribes by the Indian government. You know, they could all often be the same people. And they, indeed, as I'm sure you all are very aware, there are those who are scheduled tribes in some states are categorized as scheduled castes in other states. Vice versa is also true. Scheduled castes in some states are scheduled tribes in other states. In the forests of Central and East, East India, most villages have not only STs, those who are categorized as STs, but also scheduled castes. Uh, and their scheduled castes are often the artisanal groups who are servicing castes to the Adivasi communities. And they often have no land of their own and are often in a slightly inferior relationship to those who are STs, in fact. In the highlands of Orissa, um, Frederick Bailey long ago tried to theorize the relationship between Adivasis and Dalits, scheduled tribes and scheduled castes on a tribe to caste continuum. It's also the case that some tribes like the Santals and the Oraus lost their scheduled tribe status when they were taken as labor elsewhere, like the tea plantations of Assam. In some states, 
Adivasis have been totally stripped of their land, subsumed completely as landless laborers under feudal landlords, very much like Dalits uh, in other states. And so uh, scholars have in fact called them tribal castes. Uh, so this is how the great labor anthropologist Jan Bremen uh, called Gujarati Halis and Dublas, uh, who are, you know, who have scheduled tribe status, but then are in, in, a, in you know, in his terms, more tribal caste, not really like the tribes of uh, all, what that you find in the forests of Eastern and Central India. But I think when one thinks about the Adivasis of Central and in Eastern India, there are some very key differences between Adivasis there and the Dalits who live in the agricultural plains. And that emerges from the fact that Adivasis often have direct access to land and forest resources, which is not heavily mediated by upper castes, whereas Dalits do not. And this matters, uh, it really matters. That's, that's one of the main things I'm going to point out in this lecture and why this matters. Indeed, a comparison with Dalit communities is apt. Uh, at an all India level, Dalits and Adivasis are singled out by progressive economists. I'm thinking about you know, people like K.P. Kannan, Ravi Srivastava, um, who, and, you know, a whole range of economists who have, pro who have shown uh, that both of these communities are the poorest uh, across the nation. But when you compare between the two communities at an all India level, Dalits are presented as being better better off than Adivasis. For instance, in the national poverty statistics that the Dalits are shown to be less poor than Adivasis. However, income levels are not everything. At a wider national level, in comparison with the forest dwelling communities, Dalits often suffer from much greater immediate domination and oppression from dominant and upper castes, from feudal landlords, for instance. They also suffer from much greater internal stratification. So there are internal differences within and between Dalit caste groups. So they are part of the system of graded inequality that Dr. Baba Saheb Ambedkar so well highlighted, where even those who are victims of inequity start perpetuating its features over those below them in the hierarchy. So this is an unending system of hierarchy and inequality, which reproduces itself all the way to the bottom. So in contrast, uh, Adivasis of Central and Eastern India are, I think, much more influenced historically by relatively egalitarian values, which somewhat undermine the hierarchies of caste society. So, you know, I'm egalitarian values. I mean, I want to have some caveats here and, and I'll come on to that uh, in a minute, but you know, there are, there are, I think, some very big differences between the communities who live in the agricultural plains of India and those who live in the hills and forests of central and eastern India. And this is a belt which goes, I think, from parts of West Bengal, across Jharkhand, Orissa, Chhattisgarh, some parts of northern Andhra, Telangana, but also in the west touches on some parts of Madhya Pradesh, adjacent hilly parts of Maharashtra, and the shared corner with southern Gujarat. So these forested and hilly parts uh, where a lot of Adivasis live, I think share some kind of share some characteristics. And those who have spent any significant time living with communities who are not Christianized and not Hinduized uh, Adivasis. So I'm, I'm putting aside the Hinduized and the Christianized Adivasis um, uh, in those hills and forests they note some certain remarkable shared features when compared to the societies of the plains. As I think Virginia Kaka has long highlighted, you know, that there is a difference. And uh, the, 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 the Adivasi scholar who has highlighted the, the differences, some of the differences between um, tribes and castes. Now, in a country which is often seen as, a, as the society of quintessential hierarchy, right, of Brahminism, of, uh, of, of casteism, what is quite exceptional to me about the forest dwelling communities, whether it is the Mundas of, ja the ja of Jalkan or the Beels of the Satpura Valley or the Koyas of Telangana, is their relatively egalitarian values and the dignity and pride with which they hold these values when compared to the caste divided communities of the plains of India. 
Now, I'm not saying that Adivasi societies are, are completely egalitarian. I'm not saying that there are no hierarchies, there are no inequalities within Adivasi societies, but I'm saying that when we compare to the caste divided plains, these areas have some egalitarian values. And I'd like to highlight what some of these egalitarian values are. And I want to draw attention to three aspects of social life, as you see on my slide there, political organization, production and consumption ethic, and um, gender relations. Now, scholars who have lived amongst forest dwelling communities have noted that, you know, um, who have lived for a long time have noted that they, they that India's forest dwellers do not have forms of rule that represent enduring structures of domination and exploitation. They are societies that are largely detached from politics as leadership and control. So I'm not talking about society of MLAs or MPs or even the panchayat heads. I'm talking about like the, the forms of political organization which existed within villages before we had these kind of forms of the modern state, which have now become so prevalent, even in a place like Jharkhand, which, you know, until very recently didn't even have panchayat elections. Now, a quintessential example of these anti-hierarchical, anti-authoritarian values appear in the idea of democracy by sortition, as I witnessed it in the selection of village leaders where I lived. Um, among the Mundas and the Orangs, the most important positions of responsibility in the village are those held by the Pahan and his helper, the Pahinbara. Now, these indigenous authorities facilitate the resolution of conflict amongst Adivasis, whether it's a marriage dispute, a land claim, an accusation of theft or witchcraft. They do, they feed the entire village three times a year during important agricultural festivals. Also, they are supposed to look after families who fall in times of need. They kind of provide a welfare state or a social security net. Um, and in fact, they have special lands which are set aside for them and, uh, for this purpose. Um, they also propitiate the village spirits with blood sacrifices to protect the community from drought, fire and disease. Now, there's a lot to say about these authorities, and I'm going to present in brief here what I have elaborated in an article published last year in Development and Change, uh, which is called What If We Selected Our Leaders by Lottery? So if anybody wants to see the kind of longer version of this political argument, uh, it's, it's, um, it was in last year's um, uh, Development and Change, which was actually a, a, an inaugural lecture for, for, to, to, in memory of David Graeber. Uh, my friend and colleague. Um, uh, so you, know, or you can write to me if you want to see, you know, I can send you the article. Now, uh, just I'll give you in brief some of the political organization arguments. So, so and just I, I'm not sure how many of you are aware of how the selection takes place. So let me just show you um, uh, some pictures and just run you through it. So uh, this, this selection of the Pahan and the Pine Bara takes place every three years. And as you can see, it takes place after a, a, a festival which is called the Kalyani Festival, which is, which is after the rice harvest. When uh, so, this is amongst the Mundas. When Mundas, when in, in the villages where I live, gathered in the agricultural fields with plenty of rice beer, the spirits all need drink, uh, as do the ancestors. And then a man with a light shadow is blindfolded and given a wooden pole, at the end of which is a winnowing basket. Now, um, uh, this man is possessed by the spirit of the village, um, Sarnamai, and she guides the man, uh, the blindfolded person. She possesses the person and she starts, the man starts shaking and he walks off as if he's led by the spirit. And he wanders from the field to the hamlet and he moves from house to house and villages are gathered behind him. And at the first house, he so so he, you know, he'll move from house to house and then somewhere the, the, the spirit is going to leave him. And whichever house the spirit leaves him at where he stops shaking, that house becomes the new Pahan. Uh, for the next three years. And then the process is repeated again for the Pine Bara. And uh, this is how the next village leader is, is, is selected. 
and a few years later so this is how it's done in the in the village where i lived and then in 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 in, in a few years later i i stumbled upon the same process uh, happening in a different village and there these see these rocks these rocks all represent houses and there the man is blindfolded and see with this laura this um uh with this piece of um stone you know which you grind spices with so the laura is 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 uh, he's possessed and then he moves around with this stone and then where the, where this laura stops whichever stone he it stops on uh that is the new house uh, that represents the house of the person that will become the new uh pahan and then that new pine borough now, this is basically random selection of rotating leaders. And um, it's, you know, it is such an astonishing process. So uh, I then started to trace this to say, like, like, there must be some pattern in who is selected. And but there was no pattern. It was really like rotating between different houses. Uh, and then I realized that this place takes place in all the neighboring villages and in the colonial settlement reports of 1932, I could trace the ways in which it happens in different um, in different villages, uh, over a hundred of the neighboring villages. And they all those villages uh, had a demarcated land for those roles. Um, and it's it's very similar to a process which is now described in political theory as democracy by sortition. So there are several things to note um, about these processes. The first is that these practices are so democratic that it's a lottery as to who is selected. Um, second is that any house can be chosen, but every single house has the qualities of leading. So it really shouldn't matter who leads. Um, it's like everybody can, can, can lead, anybody can lead. So third um, is that there, you know, leadership requires no special qualities that makes marks one and creates one above other people. And this is very much in contrast to dominant models in the contemporary world where leadership is encouraged through meritocracy, individualized and personal attributes of courage, vision, direction. It's, you know, you don't have to have any of those things. Anybody could lead. And in fact, fourth is that people often don't want to be leaders at all. You know, they don't groom, accumulate wealth or petition for leadership. Rather, it's a duty, it's a responsibility. It's even a burden to serve the village. And this kind of democracy ensures the impermanence of power. So the responsibility, you know, rotates with people every three years. The power does not concentrate in any one individual or family. The real power lies in the community itself and all important decisions involve the whole community in a process of open deliberation to reach consensus. Sometimes this takes, you know, many hours, several days. Um, uh, okay, now it would be easy to characterize this as a leaderless system, uh, um, but this would be to miss the point, I think, that anyone can be a leader and leadership rests in everybody. Okay, there are many caveats to note, and I don't have time to go into them at length, but I'll just mention some of them. Uh, so first, these systems are meaningful only to some of the Adivasis, not to those who had Hinduized and not to those who had converted to Christianity. So in the Christianized villages, I don't think you get these processes anymore. Second, corruption can happen uh, if the rotation stops. So in some villages now, especially with the panchayat system, also, you know, the, the rotation has stopped and some, some families have taken over, you know, eternal being an eternal pahan or the eternal painbara. Um, third is that the spirits select the houses, uh, but de facto it is the men, and uh, not usually the women who carry out the leadership responsibilities. And fourth is I found evidence for this at the village level, but not beyond the village level. So it could be argued also that uh, lastly, the ultimate selection is down to the spirit. So it's not at all random. But, but despite all of these ifs and buts, what I want to propose is that at the core of this uh, leadership by sortition are ideals of democracy and values of egalitarianism that counter the entrenchment of hierarchy, the entrenchment of power, the entrenchment of status and inequality. 
And they're very starkly in contrast to the hierarchical ideology of caste, where only the selected few by birth have the right to rule. They're also very counter to the whole state MLA, you know, representation system. Um, also significantly, political power is not a means to economically rise above other people. In fact, the leaders are bearers of community-based egalitarian values in which a significant um, uh, economic stratification between Adivasis is actually discouraged. Okay, uh, so that's the political organization. Now let's turn briefly to the production and consumption ethic. Um, in the villages where I have lived in Jharkhand, I, several things are, 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 are quite noticeable. One is that the accumulation of wealth over time and the intergenerational transmission of property has not determined status and power within Adivasi society. Economic differences between households are often minimal and temporary due to sickness or life cycle risk ritual rather than permanent. Eating, drinking, and merry, making merry are a central part of Adivasi sociality, and this consumption is first and foremost about sharing with others, not necessarily showing your superiority, marking yourself apart from others. Uh, in fact, if you do that, you often risk uh, ostracization. And by the same token, if a wealthy person loses their wealth, they don't necessarily lose their status. So production and social reproduction within Adivasi societies have historically been non-commoditized. And there's a whole system of mutual aid through non-monetized systems of labor exchange between households, which are central to reproducing life. So like, for example, the principle is if you're building a house, you know, you help me build my house today, I will help you build yours tomorrow. Or, you know, when you're sowing fields, you know, you help me sow my rice fields today, I'll help you sow yours tomorrow. The emphasis is placed on valuing people as masters of their own production and consumption, producing without being forced to sell themselves or their products as a commodity and to develop systems of mutual aid. Um, of course, now with, without sufficient resources for subsistence living, this is not possible for many Adivasi communities who have to engage in wage labor. But Nurit Bert David, an anthropologist who work amongst the Nikes of Kerala, said that even with the entry of um, hunter gatherers into the wage economy, there was much greater con continuity within Nikan society than change. She argued that in the rubber plantations in Kerala, where the Nikans were, were going, they saw what they were doing as a form of wage gathering um, and just another way of getting subsistence to remain, um, to, 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 to maintain their cultures. Now, I'd argue that much of the participation of Adivasis in seasonal casual wage economy of contemporary India can be viewed in similar terms. Of course, all of these things are changing, and I'll turn to those changes um, at the end uh, of my lecture. Okay, then lastly, gender relations. Um, perhaps most strikingly across the forests of Central and Eastern India, what is remarkable is the relative gender equality and freedom that women have had in particular. Now, I'm not saying that Adivasi societies are egalitarian at all, totally egalitarian, that there's no hierarchy within households, um, but uh, an inequality within households. But when you compare to the caste societies of the plains, we have much more egalitarian values in these Adivasi areas than we have um, in the rest of rest of India. Patriarchy is much more muted in the Adivasi hills and forests. Um, it's not only the respect and autonomy in relation to decision-making power um, that women have over their own lives that are telling, but also what men do. In the hilly forest, it's very common to find men cooking, doing other domestic work, such as washing their own clothes, collecting water, sweeping, looking after children. The gender divide between production and reproduction is not as stark as it is in the plains. Both sexes work inside and outside the household, 
though there is often a division, though there is often a division of labor, it's neither very stark, nor is it one of dominance and exploitation, asymmetry and hierarchy. So again, I want to emphasize that I'm not saying that men and women are totally equal, but that there is much more marked um, uh, egalitarian values in the hills and forests than amongst the plains, uh, plain societies, agricultural plains, caste society. Lots of kind of examples of, of, of rituals, um, the women's hunt, the genesikar amongst the Oral, for example, um, lots of things to think with, uh, which I don't have time to go into here. But um, I think, you know, like it's, it's a few things to note. Uh, amongst the Orals and the Mundas with whom I've lived, when Adivasi women participate in wage labor or sell things they produce, they often control the money that they bring in. There's a kind of intra-household autonomy between men and women, which gives power to women and helps limit their sex sexual exploitation. Women also have much greater sexual autonomy in Adivasi society. Premarital sexual relations are not uncommon. Also, it's not uncommon to find that if relationships go wrong, men will leave, but women will also leave. And you can, you know, find new partners without facing ostracization, without facing retribution um, uh, as a result. Um, you know, the structure of joint family households, which is very notorious for the subordination of women, is rare in Adivasi areas. Divorce and remarriage is, is normal. Uh, and it's important. And importantly, it's initiated both by women and men. Um, drinking of alcohol, another, I think, key area where you can really see the differences between the plains and the hills. Generally in the plains, it's just the domain of men as in the rest of India. But um, in Adivasi sociality and religious life, um, drinking of alcohol is openly shared between men and women. Uh, to drink in private circles, as in the rest of India, would be take it, taken as an act of selfishness. Uh, the ancestors regularly have to be given drink. Um, guests must be given uh, haria or mahua as a sign of hospitality. Women and men drink together in each other's company as much as possible, and um, and 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 all, of course on ritual occasions as well. So, again, to say. To point out this relative gender equality does not mean that domestic violence against Adivasi women is absent or that sexual exploitation of Adivasi women doesn't exist or that Adivasi women and men have the same roles in society, but it is to say that women are not the second sex in Adivasi society as they are in much of the rest of India. Again, remember, I'm talking about the non-Christianized, non-Hindu, uh, non-Hinduized uh, areas. Okay, so what explains, uh, you know, to get to the next part of my lecture, why, how is it that we have this situation um, amongst Adivasi societies? What explains how they've been able to maintain these relatively egalitarian values in contrast to their neighboring caste divided communities? Now, I think perhaps the main reason Adivasis are able to maintain these egalitarian values is because of direct access to their livelihoods, material resources, which have allowed them to live on their own terms. So crucial for this uh, has been, you know, that they have an unmediated access to land and to forests to socially reproduce themselves. So this access is not mediated by caste society, and that has allowed them to develop their own cultures of egalitarian values, almost as a kind of counter power or as counter hegemonic, that is what, you know, in Gramscian terms, to the dominant hierarchies of caste India. The independence to access livelihoods away from higher castes has also enabled them to keep at bay the influence of the state and the market. Now, I'm not saying that they haven't been influenced by the state or the market, they have. However, that historically they tried to keep at bay the influence of both. 
um, you know, historically they kind of retreated away from the state. I'm reminded here of Jim Scott's Art of Not Being Governed, or as I have said of the Mundas I lived with, kept the state away. They've tried to also fight to keep away the influence of capital. They've often taken up arms to do so, waging wars against the colonial regime and the missionaries. This in turn warned them legal protection over their land and forests. I'm thinking about, you know, all the big battles we had, the Birsa rebellion, the Santal Hall, the Sadai Larai, the Coral rebellions, these, all these battles, you know, to keep away the state and capital, the colonial state and capital. Uh, and then that, again, enabled land and forest rights because legal protection was then given to Adivasis. So it's a very complicated story. These missionaries were involved in helping give those legal protections, ironically, um, uh, um, you know, something which is often not noted. But the outcome is that, you know, we've had this relative um, a relatively uh, autonomous direct control of the means of livelihood, especially land and forest resources. And that has been very important to limiting the ability of the structures of domination, stratification and exploitation in penetrating their societies, allowing Adivasi communities to socially reproduce themselves on their own terms. Today, most Adivasi communities have to supplement their ability to live off the land and forest with wage labor through seasonal migration. However, unlike the Dalit communities of the agricultural plains who are landless and do not have access to forest resources, Adivasis are not usually dependent on wage labor alone. They still have some access to land and forest. And this is really important for their ability to maintain their autonomy of social reproduction and their relate, rel related counter hegemonic egalitarian values. Okay. Um, now let's look at how these egalitarian values have been undermined, okay? Now, how have they been undermined? Many things have been rapidly changing in Adivasi areas, changing because of the state and changing because of capital. Now, the state, infiltration of the state uh, through its various development measures has not taken account of Adivasi values. It's seen them as inferior, wild, savage, jungly. So nobody has valued Adivasi society for its riches. And that has led to the destruction of those values. And specifically, two major processes have had a detrimental impact on egalitarian values uh, amongst Adivasis. And I've written a lot about this in other places. But I'll just highlight some of this uh, to you here. Um, first is mainstream education, which has been very influenced by high caste values and now is very Hinduized. The second is reservation of seats in government for scheduled castes and scheduled tribes. Now, here I am with Professor Anand Teltumde and his critique of the appropriation of Ambedkar and reservations to a godlike status. You know, he has this wonderful um, pieces called Reservations About Reservations. And uh, for me, it's not just the reasons that Professor Teltumde points out that are important, which are about the continuous stratification it causes within society and the appropriation of reservations by a, a creamy layer, that is his critique. But for another reason, um, for me, there's another reason why we have to be skeptical of what reservations has, have done, that this is that, of course, reservations have been instituted in the name of equality, equality before the law, but the problem is that they have always been implemented by a state which is constituted of homo hierarchicus, you know, <laughs> by the values of caste. And this has helped to sh shape and spread the ideologies of hierarchy in communities where they may not have existed before. Now, of course, there are now tribal groups who are asserting their tribal identity as scheduled tribes, increasingly concerned to distinguish themselves from mainstream society in order to gain access to reserved seats. But the overwhelming effect of reservations inside Adivasi society, within Adivasi society, is that in the name of equality as embodied in the Indian state, egalitarian societies have been brought into the prevailing forces of hierarchy. So that reservations have become the force of internal stratification and new hierarchies within those societies. So together, these twin processes of education and reservations have enabled Adivasis to have some upward mobility, but they've also encouraged Adivasis to develop ideals of individual accumulation of wealth, status, rank, 
and new gender inequalities. It's encouraged them to co-opt the values and aspirations for upward mobility held by upper and middle classes, undermining the counter politics of autonomy. So you get Brahminical values which start to seep into and influence Adivasi communities. Egalitarian values are undermined. Instead are promoted Brahminical purification and quests for higher caste status. And together with that, greater class stratification inside Adivasi society and also greater gender inequality. So, um, so we have documented how education and reservations have enabled a small but significant minority of Adivasis who were educated and had low level state sector jobs or had engaged in NGOs and business activities and showing how they've been started to emulate local elite norms and values which are different to the ones of their poorer kin and their lifestyles of the poorer kin. Um, so these cultures of emulation, you know, you can see them taking place through all kinds of little things, how people eat, how they drink, how they work, and which has started to, you know, emulate the local Hinduized elites rather than, you know, their own ancestors. Um, you know, you can really see this in, in, in what happens with drinking practices, you know, suddenly the local Mahua and Haria is seen as an inferior, uh, inferior kind of drinking practice. Now, suddenly people start drinking behind closed curtains and only drinking, you know, um, the alcohol of the market, the expensive liquors of the market, whether it's Royal Challenge or Old Monk or and behind closed curtains, men drinking just by themselves, you know not including women um, and these kind of habits which you see amongst caste society, those kinds of habits, you know, you see them being uh, entering Adivasi society, many Adivasis, you know, starting to drink on those terms and excluding women. I mean, it's a small thing, but it shows, you know, um, it's not a small thing. I mean, it's, a, you know, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a window onto seeing the bigger changes that are happening in Adivasi society new desires of accumulating and saving money, new patterns of com consumption, seeking, seeking to present an individual above the rest. All changes will start bringing in new degrees of stratification uh, and differentiation amongst Adivasis. Uh, at the same time, you know, this low caste upward mobility um, uh, in, uh, has been noted to come with reproducing many high caste values. And uh, the most, yeah, most striking is a patriarchal machismo amongst men at the heart of it, which is, I think, the control of women's sexuality. Another tragedy, which is that with upward mobility comes the feeling of one's own inferiority vis-a-vis -vis others in the social hierarchy. So when you see, you know, Adivasis of the older generation often roaming the forests and fields with confidence, autonomy, dignity in themselves. But, you know, the younger generations who have now had modern state education and who don't want to work back in the fields and the forests, you know, you also see new kinds of feelings of inferiority that others ascribe to them. And it's a kind of psychological trauma that actually very Elwin long ago described as the loss of nerve, you know, um, so overall, you know, these these um, like it's that there's the, the dignity which people once had in the past, you know, that itself is like, you know, getting reduced and new ideas of psychological traumas of inferiority um, are, are, are also rising. And I think there's some real interesting, interesting research to be done around this um, to, uh, to be theorized and to be thought about in terms of how we overcome this. Capital. Um, now, while offering limited protection for Adivasi lands and forests, the Indian state has overwhelm overwhelmingly protected the interests of capital, eroding the autonomy that Adivasis have enjoyed in relation to access to livelihoods in reproducing their societies. Now, mass dispossession due to mining, land grabbing for corporate interests, reform of the Land Acquisitions Act, all make it easier for capital to access land. Now, this is a form of primitive accumulation, which has had a long history. Mining and industrialization of these areas goes back to the late 1800s, but now there are new waves of accumulation by dispossession in neoliberal India, which is coming with a brutal military face. Indeed, today, the counterinsurgency forces of the Indian state in the forests and hills of India mark a kind of re a really a social death of Adivasis, apart from a literal death as well, you know. 
resistance against this trajectory of development um, has been headed by the Naxalites who've been mobilizing Adivasis, but despite their attention of, you know, from the masses to the masses, this kind of ideology of class struggle, in, in their own uh, uh, approach to Adivasis, they have had a stages teleology of revolutionary strategy, which has really missed recognizing Adivasi egalitarian values um, and Adivasis, what we can learn from Adivasis, because they've seen it as a kind of primitive past that we have to get rid of, you know? So, so the overall effect um, of this development trajectory may be to turn Adivasis into pauperized tribal castes with nothing but their labor power to sell, stripped off their counter politics of egalitarianism, and their only capacity to aspire will be in the set in, in the terms which is set by their oppressors. So in the past, in response to Adivasi resistance, the state had actually protected a degree of Adivasi autonomy by enabling Adivasis to directly access their livelihoods and control the means of their social reproduction. But it is also the state which is eroding this possibility of autonomy for Adivasis and thus Adivasi egalitarian values. Now to um, come to a few words of conclusion, uh, what is the implication of all of this? Um, for uh, for an anti-caste uh, movement. Oh yeah, here we go, I missed that slide. Let's just move on, um, here we go. Okay, so Dr. Baba Sahib Ambedkar's anti-caste movement had at its heart the promotion of egalitarian values. In India's forests and hills, Adivasis harbored these egalitarian values almost as a counter hegemony, a counter culture, a different kind of common sense to the hierarchical values of caste which pervade the rest of India. I've argued that in a society which is so infiltrated with hegemonic values of hierarchy, a hierarchy that is graded in equality, the creation and persistence of egalitarian counter hegemonic values is actually dependent on the autonomy to reproduce life on your own terms. So it's only when you have the ability to reproduce life on your own terms that you can have values which are counter to that which exists in the left of India. To have direct means to a livelihood without the mediation of upper caste and casteist values, for Adivasis who have sustained egalitarian values, they've been able to do this through their access, direct access to land and forests. I've also argued that this access to land and forest is being diminished in Adivasi areas, and with this has come the rise of caste and Brahminical values also within Adivasi society. In the Adivasi case, the fight for the protection of land rights and forest resources for Adivasis is more important than ever. And now this is not just for the, for the sake that is often argued by activists, which is for basic security of the protection of their livelihoods, but also because their control over the means of their social reproduction enables the persistence of their cultural and social values of egalitarianism in a society which is otherwise marked by hierarchy. So in order to protect these rich cultural values, counter hegemonic egalitarian values in India, people's direct access to the means of their social reproduction is crucial. For many Adivasis and Dalits, this will mean access to land and forests, a fight for access to land and forest rights unmediated by higher castes, dominant castes, to protect and expand egalitarian values in a hierarchical society. There may be other ways to go about the search for direct access to livelihoods as well. I'm not, I don't want to be prescript, prescriptive. It doesn't have necessarily have to be only land and forest rights. We can think it through. So anti-caste movements will thus have to not only struggle against caste, not only a struggle for dignity, but also struggle for material livelihoods, crucial, crucially the ability to socially reproduce life on one's own terms. The point is that the material struggles for livelihoods are important, not just in and of themselves, but in order to produce and sustain counter -hegemon hegemonic values, egalitarian values, produce a different kind of common sense to the hierarchical values of caste that pervade Indian society. Okay, I thank you for listening. Um, there we go, let me see if I stop sharing. Oh. Yeah, 
thanks professor alpashaw uh thanks for the wonderful uh, lecture and you literally you literally take us through the egalitarian values and now we will move on to the questions and answer session and i request to the participants to use chat box uh, to text your questions or uh, to raise your hand in the reaction in the reactions button so that uh, the organizers will call upon to ask your questions thank you yeah honestly you can ask your question now to alpha sha There's quite hi. a few people. Hi, 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 hi. It's, it's a really wonderful uh, uh, and um, uh, enriching uh, <coughs> to listen to the uh, uh, to the process that you have taken. Uh, one thing that um, uh, I was um, uh, wondering was, uh, at presently, I am looking at gender equity and reconciliation, and how this can be done. uh this can this process can enable undoing of untouchability so uh, uh in your uh, in your presentation how did the tribes uh the untouchability practices were there uh, how were, were they uh, they were there or they were not there and how in terms of anti caste how that those lessons can be drawn up and how the uh, anti caste movement can be drawn up towards undoing of untouchability uh, uh for a, uh, from the lessons from the uh, what presented just now so that is the major question that um, it's a process that i am going into so that's why i'm asking this question thank you thanks thanks for your um question is <laughs> such a big question and uh, in yeah fact, we have to travel we have to travel yes 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 you know i mean um i think you know caste hierarchy and its values have pervaded you know all of indian society right and now this, this whether you know even in the remotest places the state is now there you know in various forms and when the state is there it's there because usually it's you know it's coming with its its hierarchical values as well even if it is trying to promote egalitarian things like even reservations for example you know um so that's got, you know that was like one of my arguments so i think what i'm trying to argue in is like a maybe a meta kind of picture of how to think about these issues and to me it seems like um really uh e even to preserve gender equity or to nurture gender equity the you have to be able to have a whole set of counter hegemonic values which are developed against against uh, against the hierarchical the hierarchical ideologies which pervade everything in india so um you you know you need you really need we need to develop you know a different kind of egalitarian approaches which i think you know have really existed amongst the adivasi society and but the reason why they can pervade they they are they are able to exist is because uh it's so it's not just about it's not just about um uh, cultural values but the reason cultural values can exist is because of having the independence to live life on your own terms so the, the access to access to resources money life you know to reproduce life like the basic necessities of life if once you have those resources then you can produce counter hegemonic values and so you know i mean even with gender equity it's like i, I you know uh, it's to 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 go back to some of the kind of feminist arguments which developed here in england you know a long time ago is like the autonomy to have your own you know you have a roof over your head or a room of your own or you know have your have have that kind of material uh, autonomy that's really important in order to produce anything that's separate from or different to um uh, caste 
class society and its uh, and its hierarchies. So I think you know, like amongst um, like we're often talking about the fight for dignity amongst Dalits, and I think that's really really important. But I see just as important uh, the fight for you know like a material livelihood that is non mediated, non mediated by the state or, or Brahminical structures. Yeah. Thank you, Leslie, for your question. And I would Thank like you. to ask uh, Romal Vasavan to put forward his question before Alposha. Hi, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name Hi. is Aramal. I'm uh, joining from the Netherlands. So my uh, question is, uh, now that uh, the Adivasi society is also embedded in a, a capitalistic system, like uh, the resources and uh, education, it's all controlled by uh, the Brahminical structures. So how will this uh, an Adivasi community get gain access to these resources and uh, have independence over it? Say, if the reservations uh, are creating internal uh, rifts, what would be an alternative? Thank you. Thank you for your important question. I think that um, there is important work going on within Adivasi communities, Adivasis uh, who recognize the significance of Adivasi culture and trying to Adivasi language, uh, Adivasi culture, Adivasi stories. Um, you know, I take real inspiration from um, some of the people I, I, I have met, like, for example, um, there is um, you know, an Adivasi publisher called Ruby Hembron, who runs Adivani, um, who has set up a press for Adivasi stories and Adivasi writings. And, you know, I think they, these kinds of, um, uh, uh, these kinds of endeavors to really, um, highlight the value of, um, of Adivasi society and spreading that also amongst Adivasis as a kind of counterculture to the to the ones that people are so easily swept into um you know I'm I'm thinking also of people who are documenting you know different Adivasi languages um and trying to you know um uh uh, uh um basically keep uh keep alive uh the rich legacy and histories of uh of their ancestors and the past and um so i think all of these like kind of projects uh of cultural um uh, uh autonomy um which are not necessarily you know driven or mediated um uh, uh, by uh by by you know which which are which are residing in separate structures from the state or the influences of um capital of course they are they can never be completely um separate from them but i think all of these um all of these uh, initiatives are are really really important so yeah and i think there is quite a lot of work going on right now um uh, around this of course you know there's it, there's work from different different types of people with different kinds of ideologies, but there's also very a lot of very good work going on, and I take inspiration from from that. Yeah. Thank you. So, uh, if I understand you correctly, so there is a movement to bring back dignity and uh, bring back social capital to the Adivasi communities, and uh, but still it it did not uh, it wasn't very clear to me how will uh, they become part of uh, have access to the material resources like uh, in especially with global warming and depleting natural resources how can we expect that an adversary community will continue having these resources and have autonomy over uh, material wealth yeah so it's such important questions i just want to clarify something because you said that uh, you know there are, there are now um uh, at attempts to bring back dignity, you know, and uh, what I want to really highlight uh, in, in this lecture um, is that, you know, 
like the people that I met, you know, they, they, the, uh, in, in the forests and hills, like the thing that was so remarkable about them is how dignified they were, you know, how um, proud and how, uh, you know, just um, like people who, uh, you know, like, so I, like, I think we have to get rid of this idea that Adivasis didn't have dignity. They did have, they've, they've had dignity. It's just other Absolutely. people don't recognize that, right? Absolutely. So, and we can't, and, and it's not that people are now creating social capital for them. They've always had social capital. It's just that we haven't mm -hmm. recognized the social capital on their own terms, right? So, yeah. so it's not about bringing anything back or giving something new. It's about, you know, really uh, learning to appreciate uh, what there was. It's about changing our own mindsets about how we think mm -hmm. uh, about yeah. Adivasi. Right. But yeah, the other part of your, 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 the substance of your question is so important because I, that, you know, what my argument is, is that the struggle for land rights and the struggle for forest rights is really super important because we need to maintain control over the land and the forest. I think the, the fight against the mining companies, the fight against the state appropriation of land and forests for Adivasis uh, um, is really, really important. So it's not just a question of, um, uh, you know, just for basic livelihood, but it's for also all of this, the protection of these rich cultural values um, yes. and dignity and pride with which people hold these values. And to, it's it's also to to keep that that alive and protected. Yeah. And, and you know, about your questions about climate change and, um, and you know, a, a world that is, you know, in crisis, I think that if we did this, we may learn many things from Adivasi communities in terms of life itself, how to live life itself, about what is art, what is joy, what is laughter, um, relationship with the environment, you know, all of these things. Uh, there is much, much, much to, much to learn, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Romul Vasavan. Now it is uh, Robos Ranjan, you can go with your question. Hello, ma'am. Hi. Uh, hello. Uh, my question is: uh, You have written the book uh, Night March. I have read, read that. Uh, what What is the future of next light movement in India? Well, I think you know. Um, as you as you have read, you read the book, so you will see that the book is uh, a very deep critique of where they of the Naxalite movement and where where it has en ended up. Um, though I take them very seriously uh, and and what they were trying to do. And one of the big critiques is, you know, the place of arms and how that is undermining uh, their movement from within. Another is uh, the problem of how they have analyzed the Indian economy uh, with this kind of almost um, uh, like, almost like, in, in you know, taking the idea of semi-feudalism, semi-colonialism as a kind of religious mantra. So the necessity to really keep up with the times and, and reanalyze the whole economy. Um, I think, uh, you know, at the moment, it's like reduced to very small pockets on, on a defensive and it has brought the counterinsurgency forces into the lives of so many Adivasis and has caused so much destruction. Um, maybe this is something the state would have done anyway because they want access to the minerals uh, in those areas. Uh, and, but yeah, at the moment, I think that there is a need, uh, as you will know from, from having read my book, for a complete radical rethink um, within that movement to re rethink everything that they've, that they've done um, uh, for, 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 the, for the modern era to, if they have any hope of uh, working for egalitarian principles. Hello, hello, yeah. Shabai. Thank you. Thank you. I asked two more questions, and the Sarvendra Yadav, you can ask your question now. Thank you, ma'am, for such a wonderful uh, lecture. I really enjoyed it. Uh, my question is, uh, what is the major argument you are floating in your lecture is that uh, Adivasis are egalitarian because they are self-sustainable. Can you give uh, any other example where uh, you know, self-sustaining societies are uh, egalitarian? First question. And the second one is, 
uh, how uh, you take uh, that that sarna movement which is happening in right now in jharkhand uh, is it also a part of this uh, no a larger uh, egalitarian movement thanks for your really important questions um yeah so um uh, in terms of uh, egalitarian examples, there are many. Uh, historically, um, anthropologists have long pointed out um, the value of, you know, hunter-gathering communities, whether it is the um, sand bushmen of Namibia, the Hadza of Tanzania, or, you know, indigenous communities in lowland uh, Amazonia. Um, in terms of so, sorry to interrupt you, I'm not uh, asking for the tribal society. Any other society apart from the tribal? Uh, yeah, so I'm just coming. To, I'm just coming to that, right? Um, and and um, and and the idea that you know these societies had immediate access to uh, to their resources and so could be could produce uh, egalitarian communities. But recently, there's been a landmark book uh, which I really uh, all recommend to you, uh, which was. Uh, authored by um, uh, David Graeber and David Wengrove, uh, the archaeologist and the anthropologist. So David Graeber is my colleague who I talked about earlier. And it's called The Dawn of Everything. And they look at um, uh, societies through time um, into the archaeological record and show how we have always had societies who are egalitarian and, um, uh, and hierarchical living side by side. So like for example, they have, um, you know, they have examples of um, large cities in the Ukraine um, uh, going back thousands of years, which uh, they they show to be uh, egalitarian in the way in which they were structured. Um, and then, you know, the book is like full of like endless examples. And the point is that, you know, we are free to create the societies we want to create it's all in our minds and we can choose between a hierarchy and egalitarianism and many societies have chosen you know egalitarian models so for example they look at um, fishing communities in uh, California where they which exist side by side and one is hierarchical and the other is egalitarian and, um, and you know so they come to they look at how these societies right next to each other have chosen completely different paths so, um, so you know, uh, so there there are a lot of examples. I guess my kind of um, uh, what I feel, uh, what I'm trying to highlight today is, I think that in order to have that, in order to have those egalitarian societies, we have to really also think about how those societies will materially reproduce themselves. And for that, we really need to pay attention to having access to livelihoods which are not mediated by hierarchical. Um, forces so um and that's what i learned you know i i learned from from thinking about adivasi societies so yeah so if you look at the dawn of everything you will find plenty of examples thank you for... thank you i have that book i have purchased it but i have not gone through it thank you for reminding okay. me oh, to great. Read. Yeah. yeah okay uh, uh thank you so much professor alpha uh just i am poor nepali you. i am poor nepali yeah, from nepal it. You know, the Nepal is in the process of, uh, Nepal has the youngest constitutions and Nepal is in the process of uh, the policy implementations and the Ambedkar has contributed a lot. And could you please illustrate very specifically that um, Ambedkar thoughts that has been applied uh, in contemporary research, uh, London School of Economics might be uh engaged in that policy kind of the research and could you please illustrate that one thing and uh, so far i understand you have conducted the, some research on caste and class and could you please just uh, throw the some lights on the, the some conceptual framework that you have developed or you want to suggest the very relevant one uh uh, to look at the land uh, resource and and what are the strength and the lacking and and how do you feel uh, to use that framework based on the Ambedkar thoughts? Thank you, thank you so much. 
Thank you so much. Um, so you asked two very huge questions. Uh, so I'm going to um, just share some insights into one of them and suggest to you some readings for the other. Uh, sure, so sure. about your past class, uh, this is something that we have really uh, thought a lot about conceptually. Um, so if you look at our ground down by growth, and there's also an article that goes with it. You can, if you if you can't access it, write to me and I will I will send it to you. Um, um, uh, you know, that is really thinking about caste and class together. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so I, I suggest you look at that. But about your first question about Nepal and, and its kind of uh, process, I just want to share to you with you an insight. So in 2013, I was involved in a large um, uh, um, uh, a large program uh, looking at what Indian reservation policy can teach us about the Bali uh, uh, constitution building, you know. So we actually had a massive conference in Kathmandu with Nepali and Indian colleagues, um, uh, and also uh, people coming from other parts of the world, including the US where reservations have been debated a lot. Um, and to think about what we can, you know, learn from uh, from the Indian policy making for Nepali, for the Nepal's uh, Nepal um, circumstance. And the thing, the person I remember the most in that conference is Professor Anand Deltumde, and he was directly addressing on Dr. Ambedkar's thoughts and their relevance for Nepal. And he, at that conference, presented uh, you know, uh, um, uh, an an argument. Uh, about the necessity to be cautionary about reservations and the reservations, you know, within reservations, which which I also hinted at in my in my lecture I had begun with, and he was showing, you know, how this is a kind of um, uh, reservations, while may seem like a great thing, is also something which comes as a kind of poison chalice in a way, because it, uh, it, it, um, it, you know, it, it has been, of course, in the Indian case, uh, has resulted in certain groups getting, um, uh, you know, access to reservations over others. So, and then it creates like a, and then it creates this continuous process whereby you know peeps, people keep wanting to argue for their caste identity to be seen as a kind of reserved criteria and it creates divisions amongst castes when there should be alliances being created it results in a kind of identitarian politics which is very destructive of creating alliances so um you know so he was it was very very interesting to hear how he was thinking about Ambedkar thought and you know warning that it shouldn't be made into some kind of godlike status that Ambedkar himself was um, you know, constantly rethinking the consequences of his actions. He was actually the first to say after, you know, having written the constitution that I will, you know, that it, we should get rid of it, you know. I mean, he, he said it in, you know, a few years, few years after and when he saw, you know, the impacts it was having. So all of this, uh, you know, I, I think uh, is really uh, important to bear in mind um, and the application of Ambedkar, I thought, in the Nepali context. The Nepali context has many similarities, but also a lot of differences. You know, the situation of Janajatis uh, to Adivasis, the Janajatis are also many differences between them. The, the, uh, I think a lot has been learned from the Dalit movement um, in Nepal. And now, you know, you have people in Nepal who have been very much fighting around Dalit rights. And that has, you know, a lot of solidarity with Indian Dalit communities and Dalit activists, which has given rise to that. But I, 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 you know, I'm supportive of all of that, but I'd like to highlight to you the cautionary tales that Professor Anand um was warning uh, about in that conference in Nepal, in Kathmandu, thinking about the very question you are thinking about uh, back in 2013. Okay, thank you so much. I will do thank follow you, up for the, uh, the, uh, the second question, the conceptual framework. I'll write to you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, all, Fasha, for patiently answering for all our questions. And the rest of the questions, sorry for the participants. Due to cons uh, time constraint, we cannot ask all the questions and hope you understand them. Thank you. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry that there hasn't been. There's lots of brilliant questions in the chat, and I'm sorry that we haven't had time. Maybe if you if you're able to get a script of them, I'd love to have um, see see them if possible. Thank you. Sure, I mean, we'll be showing you all the questions in the chat box. Where you, yeah, over to Suresh for what of thanks. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Anand. 
Okay, uh, it was very nice, uh, long, insightful session. So it's uh, give me immense pleasure to uh, propose a of thanks on this special occasion of uh, Ambedkar Memorial Lecture. So first of all, I have to thank Alpha Shaw, professor, at, professor of Anthropology at LSE. Uh, she has done a fair justice to the topic that we that we have selected. Okay, I just want to give some glimpses uh, that I have taken notes. Like uh, in the lecture, she covered like how egalitarian society achieved uh, through the Ambeska perspective in the this Dalit and Adivasi uh, environment and how these anti-caste movements uh, help to achieve the uh, egalitarian perspective. And the three, uh, mostly three important aspects she covered, like how egalitarian values uh, can come up in soci uh, social life mostly like the political organization, production and consumption of, of ethics and the gender relations. So, and one more thing I have uh, very much impressed with the one point she told, like where the state can take up this education and reservation, where the reservation is a uh, upper mate or a positive discrimination, where the people talking about most of the n number of reasons, but uh, your point like uh, observed, like uh, today I got that like, so, the reservation is implemented by the state where you have a homogeneous caste group which actually implementing that so thank you so much for that uh, we enjoyed a lot uh, uh, with this session so next next i have to thank uh, i have to thank the uh, ghana performer uh, which was very nice uh, then further i have to thank uh, anisha for the introduction to egalitarian as well as the, the speakers so next, I have to thank uh, the moderator who actually engaged in the discussions, uh, give, uh, giving the questions. And uh, so sorry for the some questions we have not taken because of the time constraints. And uh, a special thanks to uh, our uh, inter uh, sign language interpreter, Ms. Manisha and uh, Mr. Atul for their uh, uh, continuous over the session. Okay, and uh, a special mention of thanks to the uh, old team of my egalitarian who were actually working uh, from the day onwards, like as we were uh, last week, we were at a discussion, all those things. So a uh, special thanks to my team and uh, a grateful thanks to the, all the participants. And uh, they got so much of knowledge. Like I can see the uh, people writing their insightful, knowledgeable and so on and so forth. Okay. So thank you so much for joining us. Okay. And uh, hope we will see in the future coming up with the next memorial lecture physically somewhere in uh, remote areas of India. Okay, uh, thank you so much. I just want to end a quote, uh, end a, uh, with a quote which actually egalitarian uh, uh, web page has, uh, which actually from Ambedkar, Dr. B.R. Ambedkar. So equality may be a friction, but nonetheless, one must accept it as a uh, governing principle. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, everyone. Okay. Thank you so much to all of you too. Thank you. It's been a real pleasure. An honor. A wonderful quote to end with as well. Thank you all for joining. So one more thing, it will be available in YouTube. It was actually recorded. So those who want, we can send the recording as well as it is available on our uh, egalitarian YouTube channel. You can uh, get access to that. If you don't mind, I will take your leave because I've got a four-year-old yeah, yeah, sure. background. Sure, 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 sure. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Alpha. Thank you, Alpha. Thank you, Alpha. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you a lot. And and yeah, it was it was really an honor and really wonderful. And you've organized it so well. And I really thank all the sign language interpreters as well. And the beautiful song to start with is very moving. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alpha. Manisha, to all. Take care. Bye. Thank you so much, Manisha and Atul. Aditi, they are still there? Oh, okay, I think they left.
All right. Let me end the meeting. Atul is there. Okay. Thank you, Atul. Yeah. I'm ending it for everyone. See you all.